Okay, good evening, Sunday evening, uh, and I'm going to do, I believe this lecture eight, uh, Good Morning Midnight, uh, which was in 1939, so 14 years after Mrs. Dalloway, and uh, the, big, the rise of Nazism is in full swing, uh, only about a, a year away from Hitler invading Poland. Uh, one of the events that's that happened shortly before the events depicted in, I'm sorry, I should, 1937 is this novel. Uh, so the, there's still a few years till the Polish invasion in 19, the invasion of Poland in, in 1939. Uh, but things are getting quite dark in 1937. So the title is from an Emily Dickinson poem and the American poet, 19th century American poet. Um, good, good morning, midnight, uh, daytime had no use for me or something like that. But what, you know, she's seeing the coming of war as, as a kind of midnight, another midnight is coming. Um, and uh, we're going to, I'm going to begin with a poem actually that, that, what, that was written in 1939, very close to the, uh, the start of the war where England, because England had said that Germany, if invade Poland, were at war. And that was happened in 1939. What had happened earlier is Hitler sent jet airplanes to, to Spain to help the uh, dictator uh, Franco uh, take uh, push back the the rebels that, that were trying to fight really for democracy in, in what was known as the Spanish Civil War. And no one had seen weapons like this. And no no one had seen airplanes as weapons since World War One. And uh, so in 1918. So this is 20 years later. Uh, obviously, airplanes have developed a lot, and bombs have developed that much more. And, and but no one's been using them. So partly I, to test out his jets. Uh, I mean, he was hoping to have Spain as an ally, Hitler. But I think he wanted to also show what his jets could do. So, but he picked a farm town, a market town, not even a military uh, base or objective called Guernica, and. If that rings a bell, it's it's the painting by Picasso, um, because Picasso was working on something for the for the Trocadero World's Fair in Paris in 1937, and Sasha will visit the Trocadero Fair. In fact, it's why she's apparently in Paris. Um, she isn't in great shape. Uh, she's around 40 now. It's half the time she's wandering around Paris. She's remembering what it was like in the early 20s when she was married. She had a baby. The baby died young, very young. Uh, the the marriage fell apart, and she's had been having a hard time since then. Uh, she has been drinking a lot, and so the the novel really begins because a friend had stopped her, uh, who hadn't seen her for months, and, and said, you know, you you look terrible. I'll give you a little bit of money. Go go to Paris to see this to see this fair, and uh, she doesn't. She couldn't hear less about the fair, but she has a bit of uh, money for a hotel room. But she's, she's sad, she's depressed. Um, she takes luminol a lot at night, which is a kind of um, it's a tranquilizer, a sleeping, sort of like a Valium type along, and sometimes with the alcohol. So she has to, seems to need to sedate herself a, a fair amount because she's sad and depressed and afraid and alone. Jean Reese herself is from the Dominican, where she lived on a, uh, a slave plantation owned by her grandfather, really, and then her father continued to run it, but it was really falling apart because of the slaves had been emancipated. And so she grew up in a family that was sort of neither here nor there. They, they were no longer the plantation owner masters, and they certainly weren't freed slaves. And uh, the slaves who had been freed, uh, obviously not particularly uh, caring of what happened to them. So they weren't destitute, but it was it was a difficult. Um, and, and what was weird is that she would go to this, the school for the imperialists, if you, the, the, where she was taught, you know, you're British, you're in the Dominican, but you're British, and this is what England is. And so she knows all about England, but only from books. And uh, so she thinks she knows where she's going when she first went to London, and she's just really shocked at how everything seems cold and, and people are staring at her. And she's seen by them as exotic. Uh, the, the, there often it was the case when when white British subjects who had lived for a generation or two in the islands 
uh, it was just assumed that somewhere along the line they had probably crossed bloodlines. And the racist term for this was that somebody had a touch of the tar brush, quote unquote. They, they somewhere somebody had had a, uh, a a black child, and so if anyone was seen or even imagined to have a slightly darker hue to their skin, it was extremely sensitive. There was this sense that there's there must be black a black lover somewhere and this would this tended to do two things it made the woman less marketable as a good british wife and at the same time it made her more marketable as as the, the other stereotype of the exotic sexy temperance um which sasha isn't and, and neither was reese but that that's what people saw they saw somebody not really you know a little bit touch of the tar brush not not great wife material, but but like wife material, somebody who was born in a hot country um, and was more sexual, presumably. Um, none of this is true. It was, you know, it's very self-serving. So uh, both Jean Rees and Sasha have had they've had lovers, um, but they've all there was almost a system in England at that time that really what we now call the sugar daddy syndrome. So not not exactly prostitution. In fact, not prostitution. It doesn't happen in a brothel. Uh, Sasha was never a streetwalker who could get, went up to strangers and you know gave her rate and, and nothing like that. But from time to time, a man would take an interest, take it to dinner, take it to dinner again. Uh, uh, you know, mention that there is a place you could stay uh, that they would that where they would come to see you, and then then you would be the mistress essentially. Um, and she had uh, one or two pretty serious like would last over a year or two. And the men were typically married. Their their wives were in country houses somewhere. The, the, this was a city, kind of a city lover routine. And Sasha and Jean Reese confuse it a lot. They keep wanting to become more than that. And and often it would threaten to, quote unquote. And, um, sometimes the man, the married man, would start to get too enamored of the mission. And it was presumed that his other male friends would intervene. Um, in one of Reese's other novels, uh, the, the friend of the man that she's uh, being kept by comes by and, and asks, gives her money and says he can't see you anymore. And the, and uh, she she knew she felt like they had more than just a sex connection, and they apparently they did. But he's not about that. No one's going to let this, him throw away his respectable British family and uh, for an, an attractive. The, you know, woman from the Dominican, no, no, no matter how much he might have enjoyed her company. So it's, it's a, it's a system, and, and it takes her a while to even figure it out. You, you'll, you'll see there's a lot of machinery imagery in uh, Good Morning Midnight, um, steel fingers and cold eyes and waving cables, uh, and, and of course subways and uh, all of the other machinery of, uh, of a modern city. But what, what Reese is doing primarily is saying, you know, all this machinery works its way into human relationships. Uh, in some ways, Sasha could be viewed as an older Sybil Vane, someone who didn't kill herself, but got used and abused by uh, by somebody like Dorian Gray um, and managed to survive it, but is still kind of single and vulnerable and, and tends to be, um, to varying degrees, used by men, either uh, harshly or, or even, quote, nicely, but not not in a way that's long term or secure, and also in a way where there's always a pressure to perform. Um, unlike, say, the husband wife relationship, that's, there's, it's kind of an unstated rule that if a mistress is no longer um, making, showing an interest, uh, you don't, you move on. I mean, you find it, you get another mistress. Um, so no matter how much romance there might appear to be in these relationships, they're performance based. And I, I mean, I've seen billboards for the whole sugar daddy phenomenon now, and uh, it's a fairly active. It's fairly active in Toronto. Um, not unheard of for university students to uh, have a, a man, an older man, who helps with tuition, and once in a while they stay over. Um, and given that women are seen so much as as commodities on the marketplace, and part of the Part of the strain of this novel is that Sasha's getting too old to for her looks to attract the kind of men who would be willing to 
pay pay for her upkeep. Uh, she still has a nice coat, but that was given by someone quite a while ago. And the only man she meets is this guy named Rene, uh, who is kind of a gigolo. He's, so he's the other side of things. He, for older women uh, who want a charming younger man. So it's at the reverse. And she's, of course, that's a shock as part of her. She's a little like Maria in Clay, although not, not as self-deluded. But uh, she doesn't, she knows she's older and it worries her all the time. Um, but she also is surprised when people act like she's older. And so when she realizes that he has asked her for a drink, and at first she's like, handsome guy asks uh, attractive lady for a drink. It's a pickup. It happens. And it, but then she realizes with a shock that, that he's sort of a professional, that, that, he's, that he has read her as a still attractive um, aging woman who might not have much romance in her life, might be married, might not, but would be willing to have a stable um, man to uh, certainly as a lover, but only when she wants, and, and maybe not even that if, if she doesn't, but somebody to go to dinner with. In other words, she would be in charge. She would be in control of the relationship if she had money, which she doesn't. The coat's expensive. So she realizes with a shock that, oh my God, it's the coat. Well, you've made a mistake. She talks to herself a lot. Like 90% of her thoughts are not spoken out loud. And you can sometimes you can forget that when you're reading. But you need to remember that she never says any of this stuff out loud. Cause she says very, uh, she really takes people down and she's smart as hell. And she's no fool. She always sees the gears. She always sees the cogs and wheels, but she's scared and she's disenfranchised and she's on the margins and she's forced to perform, which she does. So all these insights that she gives, reading the, the way that women are treated in the city uh, is unspoken because she feels she has no choice but to play the game in a way, to, to be the, uh, be a woman who's, uh, she doesn't really trade on her attractiveness. As, as I said, she's not a prostitute, uh, but she's, she does raise that disturbing question that in, that if they're in certain circles, what's the gradation of a woman who gets married versus a woman who um, allows herself to be kept? Um, there's, there's, I think, there's a part of Sasha that um, doesn't want to be doesn't want to be in a marriage with no love, and ironically, she loves she falls in love with these men who are married elsewhere, and they don't. The marriage wouldn't have been rubbed in your face. You'd never see the wife. You'd never be invited to the house. There, 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 there's no running around. So it's easy when you're having an affair, essentially an affair, to not think about it as an affair all the time, because the man would be any time the man's in the city, he would pretty much be your partner can come to see you and take you to dinner and spend the night. Usually not to not spend the night, actually. Uh, that's that's a point she notices is that, uh, that they tend to leave at midnight, two o'clock, whenever whenever the intimacy is over. And, and so she hears she hears taxi doors slam at two in the morning. This this is part of her melancholy and depression, because even when the guy's nice and even when he's a consistent lover, that that not staying over for the night um, just keeps reminding her that this is, is still an exchange. And sometimes there's money left on the bedside table, no, no stated amount. Um, there's a lot of care taken so that it doesn't look like uh, um, a, a straight up money for sex. Uh, and that'll be important in the final scenes with, with Renee, where, where she can't tell whether he wants to be with her in some, you know, humane way or whether he's gaming her to the end i mean she goes back and forth and one minute she's like oh he's he's gaming me i'm just uh, I'm, I'm a mark i'm a john or a female john other times she's she he says things that are vulnerable and and move her and she says oh he's lost and disenfranchised um just like me and maybe we could be something for each other uh, and she's just like this, back and forth, back and forth. She can't, and, and part of it is she does, she's lost a lot of ability to state her own worth to herself. She spent most of her life trying to read her worth in the regards of others. And again, a lot like Sybil Vane, um, who feels amazing and wonderful when Dorian Gray shines his charm on her and, and is absolutely gutted when he just clicks eye um, and says, without your heart, you're nothing. Um, so this is, this is 
the, um, the modern city novel this is uh, a lot about femininity, the masquerade of femininity, the way that femininity is a performance in the city, um, not even just in the city, but how women look is different. It, it's valued differently than how men look. Um, not to say that there's nothing about how men look, but uh, you know, take a, take a news show like CNN. Uh, they are very professional women. They're just as good as the men, but it's hard to not notice that they're all also young and quite attractive. And uh, I got nothing against Wolf Blitzer, but he's not Brad Pitt. Uh, and uh, there are some older, uh, not that much older, women reporters. So it, it, it's nobody talks about it exactly. And it's, I guess, what we these days are calling unconscious bias. But uh, to be on CNN, these women have to be good. Don't, don't get me wrong, they're, they're top notch. It's just there's an unconscious bias that if there's five women and all five are good and look like models, um, then they're gonna have an advantage. Uh, no one has to say it, no one has to talk about it. Um, it they do have to be good. Uh, they're not gonna give the job to a group. Unlike, I hate to say it, unlike the, the current White House press secretary who worked for Fox and uh, and actually, I, I take it back. I, I, I don't think it's true that she's not good at being a journalist. She's not trying to be a journalist. Um, I think she may be quite smart, actually, in, in her own way. But she's just trying to the Trump train and say whatever she has to say. And she's pretty clever about how she does it. Uh, so, uh, I mean, she probably could get a job on CNN if she wanted to actually report news and not just what she's told to say by a president who's permanently steeped in self-denial. Um, sorry, this is a little little political aside, but politics is important because this is a novel that's taking place in the rise of fascism. And fascism is the most machine-like political organization you can have. There's a reason that fascist regimes love uniforms. They love marches. They love weaponry. They love to march with their weapons. They love the, and Trump wants to do all this. He, to have military parades up and down in front of the White House. But uh, America is not fully cultivated to, to be fascist. And, and that tension has been holding for the last four years. Uh, if, if America did not go fascist, and it hasn't, it's uh, no thanks to Trump, who has done everything that Mussolini or, uh, well, I won't say he's done everything Hitler did, but it, it, he hasn't had a chance either. There's something about fascism that it, it's machine-like in two in the sense that it won't stop. There's no compassion. It can be very organized, um, it, and it can be in that sense it can be relatively successful. One, I mean, Hitler was a private in World War One. He was wounded in trenches. He was, he was not accepted to art school in all three times he tried. He was uh, seemed to be a failure on every possible level. Uh, how did he get? How did he do what he did? Uh, I mean, he had a very good eye for how desperate Germany was, um, that it had been flattened. There there were these terrible war reparations that kept the German economy um, just in the gutter. Uh, and uh, they were desperate for someone to step up and say, I know what's wrong. I know how to fix it. Um, and, that, and Hitler said that. And he radio very effectively for the first time, just like Trump used Twitter for the first time. No politician had used Twitter before. No politician before Hitler had used radio before. So the, there, there's a lot of affinity between the two, not so much to, to say Trump's a horrible, horrible, genocidal something or other, that's taking it too far, but both are, were media, masters of the media. And they, they knew how to play people in mass media. Um, there actually was no such, the word mass media didn't exist for, for Hitler, but uh, I believe Trump has 90 million uh, followers on Twitter and nobody saw that coming. And certainly no one saw, I didn't see that coming from a man who's 74. I still don't know how to do Twitter. Uh, I mean, grand, I'm older too, but I, honestly, who expects grandpa to uh, take over a country with Twitter? But it kind of happened. Um, I'm not quite sure what's gonna happen when the transition will take place. And I'm just not, there's something about social media that that continues whether you're in the White House or not. So we'll have to see. I honestly don't know. We're, we're on uncharted territory as we were for most of the last four years. 
Um, so Auden, who's a really, W.H. Auden, is a great poet. And in 1939, William Butler Yeats died. Now you'll remember him because he wrote The Second Coming in 1919, turning and turning in the widening gyre. So 20 years after writing that poem, Yeats has died. Uh, and Auden, so on this, the first thing poem is, is a, is a tribute to Yeats. Uh, Yeats won the Nobel Prize by then. He had a, did a lifetime of poetry. He's still seen along with Eliot as, you know, probably the top two practitioners of, of poetry in the English language in the, in the entire 20th century. Uh, Auden's very good too. He was British. He came up with the phrase, the age of anxiety, actually, to, to describe when I borrowed uh, to talk about that in here. But in what, we're going to walk through the poem, and I'm going to post the poem on announcements so you'll have a copy of the poem. So you, all you have to do for now is, is listen, or if you want, go to your announcement and pull this up. I haven't put it on announcements yet, but by the time you see this. Um, he's simultaneously praising this amazing poet, but he's also very interested in, you know, how much does it matter when a, when a poet dies? What's the difference between a poet dying and a man dying? Uh, or a banker dying. Um, like, what's the difference between W.B. Yeats dying and, say, um, a, a Rockefeller or some super wealthy person? The difference, of course, is that did poets um, breathe spiritual energy into everyday life? Uh, there's nothing necessarily wrong with bankers, but they don't do that. And the irony is that poetry doesn't really make any money. Uh, trust me, <laughs> I've had I've had poems published, um, and that's not how I make my living. Um, this this is my day job, and uh, the, if I had to if I had to eat based on my poetry, I don't think I'd be a skeleton. Um, but that's all right. I mean, I I can write poetry if I feel like it. I just have to know that it's not going to pay the rent. Uh, even the very best poets are, they usually now are affiliated with universities. So we have the we have the wonderful Daniel Tisdall, uh, who's great, but his his day job is teaching. I mean, even he, who publishes widely and, and so well, um, couldn't pull down a salary. It's and and the poems are, are brilliant. So it's 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 we're back to the price of everything and the value of nothing. Uh, value of poetry is not something you can monetize. And I think I've said this before. It takes time to read poetry, or or it doesn't work. And time is money, but poetry doesn't reward you with money. Poetry introduces you to a part of yourself that you don't know very well, which is to me is invaluable. You know, you can't you can't even put a price on it. But but in reality, it's in economic terms, it's, it's worth zero. It's worth nothing. Uh, anyway, let me start reading through it because I, then I want to read some passages of Good Morning Midnight and uh, because of these both this poem and the novel are both are written in the same time frame, late 30s. And, and this is going to set us up for the last laugh, the 1925 film out of Germany, which, which we will look at. And then finally, Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times, 1936, which is the comic take on all this. But, it, but it's a work of genius where the comedy is still in dialogue with these sad, you know, disturbing poems like this and, and novels like Good Morning Midnight. Um, so the poem begins, he disappeared in the dead of winter, yes, in Malachi Yates. The brooks were frozen, the airport was almost deserted, and snow disfigured the public statues. The mercury sank in the mouth of the dying day. What instruments we have agree, the day of his death was a dark, cold day. Now this phrase, what instruments we have agree, the day of his death is a dark, cold day, will be repeated two or three times more in various forms throughout this poem. So what instruments we have is arguably the most important phrase in this poem, because what Yeats is saying is the machinery of unity of capitalism, it's, it, it has no way to measure how much we've lost in, uh, in losing W.B. Yeats. Um, you have to ask yourself, you know, the, the, the hegemonic discourse, the dominant discourse of modernity acts like all, we have all the metrics needed to measure reality. But act, and, it, what, and therefore, what the metrics of modernity measure is the sum total of reality. But it's the, it's the opposite. 
metrics determine what you mistake for reality. So uh, if you, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, it, it's, you know, the, it, depending on your metric or your rubric, it, you get your rubric self and you discover things, but actually it's like Sir William Bradshaw, it's just stamping the same pattern on whatever happens to be there. And then it's misrecognized as having somehow discovered what in fact it just stamped. So like a coin or something, it's like you take some soft copper and you press it and it looks like a penny and you say, oh, that that's a penny. No, it's a piece of copper. So copper is the, is the real and then the penny is the reality and they're the same material, but one is shaped. And the, the problem with our metrics is we forget that a penny is also uh, copper which could be it also could you could stamp it a different way it's, it's even more weird with paper money because a hundred dollar bill and a five dollar bill are worth the in terms of the material of the, of the plasticized paper they're worth the same uh, and if you offered a hundred dollar bill or a toonie to a kid who's three they're going to take the toonie um because they're not they don't have they're not thinking in the symbolic order yet the toonie's got a polar bear on it for god's sake and it's shiny uh, and why if it's worth so much more to a three-year-old than a piece of paper and you could point out to them like well look this has the numbers on it one zero zero this this one this is worth a lot more and they first of all they wouldn't know what to do with a hundred dollars anyway so they're like give me the shiny coin and it's, it's it's actually a developmental phase when when you can start to say okay cool i'll take the i'll take the hundred bucks around age four maybe um Around the same time that when a teacher asks you to draw a picture uh, of what you see in front of you, uh, at certain ages, the kids don't do a, draw a picture of the teacher, they draw a picture of themselves, even though that's not what they're seeing. It, so later they, they realize that they're supposed to be trying to figure out how to represent the teacher, but that's a later, Piaget is the guy, some of you guys may have heard of him, who had got into these development stages, like at what point can a child this or that and, and so on. So the, what instruments we have, that's really important that he put it that way. He didn't say our instruments agree. That'd be a very different statement because that would fall into this trap of saying that all the instruments we need to measure, we have, but we don't. We have no way to measure compassion. We have no way to measure hatred. We have no way to measure love. And don't tell me how big is the engagement ring. <laughs> but that's really interesting, isn't it? That, uh, Nobody really, I mean, it'd be the height of roots to say, are you sure he loves you? That's a dinky little ring. Um, and yet, let's face it, th these thoughts could occur, like you're engaged and he got you something out of a Cracker Jack box. I mean, there's a reason you don't get on one knee and say, will you marry me and, and give somebody a bagel? Um, it, when you think about it, it shouldn't matter. It, it, yeah, I love you, I wanna spend my life with you. You're everything to me. Here's a bagel. Okay, done. You blew it. Um, and you could, and, and then by the same, and you could be totally in love, or you, you could even be a jerk uh, and have a, a like one carat diamond ring, and you're like, I love you. You're everything to me. And then, then you know, everybody's crying, and oh my God, the love of the century. Why? Because it's some rock. Um, so, it, and I'm, what I'm saying is, there's no relationship. Love is love. It's not a diamond. But it's interesting that we pick diamonds because we value love so much. And uh, diamonds are expensive because they're relatively rare, although there's some argument that it's, a, that it's an artificial scarcity, that there's a lot of diamonds that big diamond companies keep in their vaults. Uh, they don't want to flood the market because the price of diamonds would, would then drop. So, but it's, it's, it's definitely rare, but it may not be as rare as it is made out to be. And the other thing is it's the hardest substance known and we want love to be enduring. So you, you pick something super expensive and able to cut everything else without being cut itself. And so what you really, that's the, that's the symbol of, of the diamond ring. I love you. Uh, my love is, is proof against anything. Nothing's gonna cut my love. Nothing's gonna cut us apart. Um, and it, it cost, you know, this symbol was really super expensive but I don't care because I love you more than money and all these kinds of things. And, um, but the reality is you love the person as much as you love them and the ring has nothing to do with it. 
uh, and they love you as much as they love you, and the ring has nothing to do with it. Love is is invaluable. It can't be monetized. The diamond ring is, is is somewhat of an attempt to monetize it, although not it's not like prostitution where where you give somebody money and say, "Well, let's have sex," and then I'm just going to leave. But it is an attempt to monetize something that you can't, because love is not in you, and love is not in the other person. Love is what happens between and even among people, if you're thinking about family. Love is trans it's kind of the equivalent of a transcendence, which is one reason I think it's still one of the most sought after experiences in modern life, because it's a transcendent experience. Whether there or not there's transcendental certitude, and that's what Matthew Arnold winds up saying, right? Like we're not certain about transcending God anymore. So we better love each other as the new transcendent. So our love is the new God in a way personal uh, we created this God for each other. And as long as we each love each other, this tr we have transcendence. And, you know, it does work that way a little bit. When you're in love and you have a partner, you can be in a store somewhere and you see a cute um, card or, or some, you're like, oh, he really loves The Simpsons. And uh, here's, a, here's a Bart figurine. I'm just going to get it. it that, that's that's just kind of a transcendence because you're, you know, he's not there. Uh, he's not saying I really want that Bart figurine you're thinking about him even though you're alone and that's that's where love can feel transcendent and and very welcome because it's nice to not feel alone it's nice to care about somebody else even when they're not there even when you're not actually getting something from them the the moment of love and I'll, i those who take the film class p76 when i do the thing on hollywood romance you're going to hear more about love uh the hard thing in modern life is to, is to move from negotiation to intimacy. Dates, Tinder, all that, nego that's negotiation. Sweep, sweep left, sweep, what the hell do you do? Skip left, skip, swipe, Swiffer, I don't know. And you do something and uh, they either stay or they go. That's negotiation. And then you have the first date and it's still negotiation. You know, you dress nicely, they dress nicely, or they don't. And that might be the last date. Uh, if it isn't, you have a second date, typically still negotiating. The third dates, everyone seems to think a fourth date, if, if not sex, it's supposed to mean that you're really thinking about stopping the interview because the first three dates are, it is like trying to get a job with corporate in a funny way, even though it's supposed to be real. And it, 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 it is in a sense, you're finding out whether your reality is uh, shored up by um, the way they treat you and they're, figure out the same thing um, and you're both trying to get out from under the predatory vampiric relationship of self to other that's Sasha's problem these vampire men are preying on her they're not looking for transcendence with her and that's the difference between being loved and being used and and that can be why your friends say well he only calls you you know when he can't find anyone else and he's he's using you he's, he's uh, he feeds off you when he needs it and he ignores you when he does that's that's not a, that's negotiation and you're not negotiating because you, what you don't want to do in a relationship is just is to move to intimacy when the other person is still negotiating uh, because they could just accept your intimacy and walk away so w one reason these love you know even on the screen when the two people finally kiss and say i love you and i love you too uh you want to move into intimacy together and you don't want one person still negotiating in their mind you've already said wow I'm in love. I'm not, I don't have to keep track of whether we went to a nice restaurant, whether they remembered to open every door, uh, or whether she was still, you know, in a good mood all the time. It's like, oh, it's okay. She doesn't have to be in a good mood all the time because I, I love her. That I love her moods and that sort of thing. Nothing measures that, uh, and and you can't buy love. And I didn't invent that phrase either. You can buy sex, um, but that's not love. So what instruments we have agree, the day of his death was a dark, cold day, meaning that thermometers said it was like minus 20. But what's that got to do? with it? Far from his illness, the wolves ran on through the evergreen forest. The peasant river was untempted by the fashionable keys. By morning tongues, the death of the poet was kept from his poems. So what's this, what this does, it says, you know, by all accounts, looking around, nothing's changed. Yeats died. 
in, in a bedroom somewhere attended by nurses. And it's not like the river stopped flowing. It's not like the wolves stopped running. Uh, and the, but the, then the crucial line is the death of the poet was kept from his poem. So this is where Auden's going to start showing why the death of Yeats both is, is very sad and also an occasion to celebrate the power of poetry because Yeats is dead, not his poems. I mean, you read his poem. Uh, it was on the midterm. It's very alive. A lot of you liked it. I've seen it in some of the work you've done on the, uh, on the extra points already. Uh, you may, some of you will probably write about it in your journal. It's, it's a living poem because it can come to life for you. You never met Yeats. Yeats never met you. He'd been, he was dead way before you were born. Uh, but the poem is immortal. I mean, I'm not saying it could never be forgotten if there's a apocalypse, but uh, it it will do what it does. And and incredibly, it will do it 100 years later, 200 years later. Um, it doesn't date itself. That's the other ish difference between, say, commerce and poetry, or even science, which is, science is great. But can you imagine going into your chemistry uh, class and having the guy say, we're going to use a textbook from 1919, because it's a really good textbook. I mean, maybe it was in 1919, but you, you would walk out of that class and, and, and you'd be right. You can't, you know, I mean, wasn't there only like six elements in the periodic table? Um, that you, you can't learn the, you can't learn science as you should with a hundred year old chemistry textbook, but you can learn about your, your humanity with a 1000 year old poem. Uh, or if you go to the sacred documents, uh, the Quran and the Bible, two, 3,000 years old. And it's as relevant to, to your talk as if it were written tonight. That's the power of wisdom and art. Um, so the death of his poet, the poet was kept from his poems. They're, the poems will go on living. Um, they don't have to be told that, oh, by the way, the man who wrote you is dead, so you are dead too. Uh, they're not, uh, they don't need the poet to stay alive because the life that, it, that the poet put into the poem is in the poem now. But for him, he, going back to the poem, Yeats, it was his last afternoon as himself. Not, not the last afternoon as someone we're going to hear about because we're going to read the poems he wrote, but his last afternoon as a living, breathing man, an afternoon of nurses and rumors. The provinces of his body bolted. The squares of his mind were empty. Silence invaded the suburbs. The current of his feeling failed. He became Myers. That's to say, he kind of he became I, he became me. I mean, I'm I'm one of his admirers. Maybe some of you are too. And that's what's left of Yeats. He's still here, as I read his poem in an admiring way to you guys and say, look at this. Look, look how what this can do. Or you stand in front of a Van Gogh painting and so on. Start by night. Um, the current of his feeling failed, and that's so he died, and then he became, in that moment, his admirers. Now, and, and this is, so this is kind of a transformation, now he is scattered, not as ashes, although that's probably the reference. He, he, now he is scattered among a hundred seas and wholly given over to unfamiliar affections. In other words, the people who love Yeats are the people he's never met in many instances, because even the people who have loved him are also going to, to die within his generation. So eventually, all the people who love Yeats will be people he's never met. I mean, that's certainly the case now. Uh, to find his happiness in another kind of woods and punished under a foreign code of conscience, and who, who knows where he went, what, what kind of heaven uh, there might be. And then one of my favorite lines, the words of a dead man are modified in the guts of the living. And what's great about this is, is the, he's saying that the word, you know, Yeats had something in mind when he wrote nine, the, the Second Coming and World War One, obviously. But the need of the poem will get will get digested by readers, you know, and so the the words, he's dead. He can't modify these words. He's not going to do a, set, a a rewrite of the Second Coming. He couldn't do it if he wanted. But the poem will get rewritten over and over again, modified, not by Yeats, who's dead, but by the, the guts of us who are reading it. Um, so the words of the dead man are modified in the guts of the living, but only if that, those words are hard. 
um, nobody's going to read the checking account of Rockefeller or Buffett or, you know, who cares? And they had a ton of money and now they don't. There's not a whole lot of wisdom in that. Um, but, and then, and then he goes to uh, the stock market. But in the importance and noise of tomorrow, when the brokers are roaring like beasts on the floor of the bourse and the poor, the bourse is the German stock exchange, and the poor have the sufferings to which they are fairly accustomed. And each in the cell of himself is almost convinced of his freedom. A few thousand will think of this day, as one thinks of a day when one did something slightly unusual. What instruments we have agree, the day of his death was a dark, cold day. You were silly like us, your gift survival. Parish of rich women, physical decay, yourself. So here he's making the point that Yeats was uh, a genius as a poet, but he was also just an ordinary person like you and me. He made mistakes, said silly things, said things he regretted, uh, got old, was upset by national events. The next line is, mad Ireland hurt you into poetry. And that also is one of the reasons his poems are so great, is that they come out of being wounded, they come out of being loved, they come out of being hated, they come out of being afraid. Uh, now, Ireland has her madness and her weather still, for poetry makes nothing happen. And this is an important paradox. We need nothing to happen. We need to have moments where we're not doing anything. Um, hurry up and, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't just do something, stand there. That's not the way we usually say that. We usually say, don't just stand there, do something. But in poetry, you don't just do something. You stand there, you confront yourself, you experience yourself, you let the poem happen. And the poem makes nothing happen. You can make, nothing can be an event. Uh, we'll see that with Waiting for Godot in, in A11. It's the most important event because we what we do is not, the sum total of who we are. Um, we, are we're, we're, we have a being, not a doing. A being has can do, but doing is, is just a subset of being and not, not often the most important part. Who you are is, uh, is certainly related to what you do, but it's also more than, than the sum of the parts of what you do. I keep making point with your grade point average you know you're not a 2.2 or a 4.0 you're either that's and that's a that's a metric and I don't really like that metric because it's it's asked to judge too much of you, you have, there's no way you can get reflected your full worth in a single digit um, and yet that's how the machinery of grad school works the machinery of applying to grad school it's it, it, it needs uh, you have to plug in your your little number even though there's nothing in that number of any value. It may represent valuable things, but there's no direct correlation. You could have gotten an enormous amount of uh, university and have a 3.0, and, and you could have just skated and you know just shook it off like water off a duck's back, and, and you've got a 4.0. Uh, the number's not gonna say which is which. So for poetry, it makes nothing happen. It survives in the valley of its making where executives would never want to tamper because there's no money in it, flows on south from ranches of isolation and the busy griefs, raw towns that we believe and die in. It survives a way of happening, a mouth. Earth, receive an honored guest. William Yates is laid to rest. Let the Irish vessel lie, emptied of its poetry. In this case, the man that did, who has just died is just an Irish vessel. But all the poetry that was in him has been poured into the poem, so it's okay. It's okay that the vessel broke. I mean, we get old, we pass on. And, but the, but he managed to pour all the poems out of his, the vessel of his, his flesh, of his body, uh, before he died. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, we pivot to, to this political situation in Europe. Because the, Auden wants to make one final point. World War II is coming because we don't read poetry. Uh, it's coming because we've lost sight of compassion, lost sight of generosity. Uh, we've, we've stopped loving. 
the transcendence is gone. Everybody's negotiating. There's no intimacy. Uh, it's everyone for themselves. Uh, I, I want my piece of the pie. Keep your hands off my stack, uh, as Pink Floyd puts it in their song. And so we get this remarkable line, in the nightmare of the dark, all the dogs of your bark and the living nations wait, each sequestered in its hate. So these are, the nations are all ready to jump on each other again. And they're, they're isolated from one another. Intellectual disgrace stares from every human face. And the seas of pity lie locked and frozen in each eye. So the eye compared to a lake or a sea, um, which might normally, you know, have waves and, and sun, and, uh, but it's frozen. Um, there's no pity. Nobody's eyes have pity. And this is the, this, and the only person, the only thing that can save people who are locked and frozen in, uh, in hate is, is love. And the only thing that can really remind us of how much we want that transcendence of love is, is art. Follow poet, follow right to the bottom of the night. With your unconstraining voice, still persuade us to rejoice. With the farming of a verse, make a vineyard, the curse. Sing of human unsuccess in a rapture of distress. Sing of human unsuccess, not how much money you made and how fast you climbed the corporate ladder and what your newest car is. Nothing wrong with any of that, but that's not the human, that's not the song of humanity. In some ways, that's, those are all the things we distract ourselves with uh, and don't, because we don't want, we're afraid to make nothing happen. Uh, not, making nothing happen is a little like what Wallace Stevens said, death is the mother of beauty. Uh, it, it is our mortality that makes living beautiful and precious. And, and yet if we never ourselves be pretful present and let the nothing happen in the moment that we're in, uh, we can miss. Uh, we, we like the distraction because then it's easier, but we miss the full complexity. And love, real love, um, is, is also makes something happen. It makes it. We, you know, you know how it is with lovers. If you see lovers in a cafe, they could be on the moon. They wouldn't notice. And you look at them and like, oh my god. And then when you're in love, doing it, you'll be the one that other people are like, wow, those people. You know, they're there. You're hunched over, you're talking, smiling, laughing, um, you poking each other with straws. I don't know, whatever, whatever you do. But uh, yeah, and the rest of the world can just go hang itself. Uh, you got it. it, it and that kind of love may, may not last all the time, but it can be built on. And you cannot know yourself without knowing how someone else knows you. And that you want it, and only someone who really loves you and wants to be intimate with you and not just negotiate. I mean, you can go to a therapist and that's fine. That's an, and you can learn a lot. Part is a negotiation, $100 an hour, and they work hard to help you. You can go to a prostitute and have sex, whatever it is, $200 an hour, and that happens. But it's a negotiation. It's a simple exchange. There's no transcendence. In the depths of the heart, let the healing fountain start. In the prison of his days, teach the free man how to praise. And it's a little like what Elliot said earlier about each of us sits in a cell thinking of the key. You know, that we, get, we, we accept that we're locked in so we can have the fantasy that we'll be rescued. It's a, but you can miss the, the moments. Everything you... Everything you need is already here. If you can be here, and if someone else be here with you, then pretty much all you, you know, even that phrase, all you need is love, all these cliches, that's kind of true, but it's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, it's, it's, so it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. And there's a, there's a real difference. So now I'm gonna pivot to Good Morning Midnight, which is written in this same, uh, time frame of, of approaching war. And uh, the first thing we'll look at is, the, is her first dream. And there's two major dreams in the book, really two dreams, one at the beginning and one near the end. And they're both very telling. Uh, so um, I'll read the first dream. I am in the passage of a tube station, subway station in London. Many people are in front of me. Many people are behind me. Everywhere there are placards.
printed in red letters, this way to the exhibition, this way to the exhibition. Now there was in fact an exhibition in 1937 at the Trocadero, you'll see, you'll see it in the discussion notes. And it was a last ditch attempt to get students to unlock the, the pitiless stare. And unfortunately, it became almost a kind of frozen monument of the, the hatred that was about to be launched. So the German embassy tried to build its embassy taller than the Russian embassy. Uh, they stole the plans of the Russian embassy. They could build theirs taller. And mostly they were, in many cases, they were just showcasing weaponry new jets, new machine guns, new, they were basically saying, this is, we're going to annihilate you. It's so it was the most disturbing world's fair ever. And Picasso had already scrapped whatever his original idea was for the Spanish pavilion. And that's where he premiered Guernica. And meanwhile, the German pavilion was premiering the movie uh, Triumph of the Will, uh, Lenny Riefenstahl, which you may have read, which was a propaganda documentary of, uh, of the Nuremberg uh, marches, the Nuremberg rally. That these are you've seen clips of this movie, whether you know it or not, because it, this is where all the famous uh, Zig Heil, Zig Heil, um, you know, in unison by thousands of people, just this massive show of force with, with Hitler just ranting at the front. Uh, and he comes in on an airplane, like something out of Mrs. Dalloway, like a god descending. It's very, very fascist um, in the sense of he's coming from beyond to save you, to, like a god. Uh, so, so she's obviously so she has this dream, but there probably these placards would have been all over Paris as well. So they are printed in red letters: this way to the exhibition, this way to the exhibition. Uh, now, for the most part, it was called the exposition. So I think we're already seeing a play on words in the dream, where part of what she's feeling as a woman, no matter where she turns, she's being told to exhibit her. That she is. Exhibit A, this way to the exhibition, this way to show yourself, this way to attract a man, this way to get married, this way to find someone to, to put you up, this way to get fooled and tricked, um, if, you know, this way to buy a new dress, this way to, because she thinks a lot about dresses and shopping and buying and, she, and her new hairdo, you know, all the things that are on the cover of Cosmopolitan magazine today. Um, so... But I don't want to the exhibition. That's her feeling in the dream. She isn't, she's tired of masquerading as feminine, uh, performing for her supper, so to speak. I want the way out. How do I get out of, of having to exhibit myself as a quote unquote woman, which really means a spectacle that make men feel better about themselves, which is a lot of work for a woman. And again, with love, a woman or man for that matter might not have a problem uh, masquerading and working to make the other person feel better, but it's more mutual. So if if your partner uh, had, like there's a favorite sweat that he likes, he would wear it and, and it wouldn't feel like you're an object being forced to exhibit. You want to do it because he likes the sweater and you like him and then vice versa, um, that he would uh, do something that, uh, that you like. Um, one of the first ways you know that you're, you, you're still you're moving from negotiation to intimacy is is when you finally have an honest discussion about what movie to watch and it turns out that he didn't want to watch every hollywood romance in the world for the rest of his life and you fib too because you don't want to watch rocky one through six over and over again for the rest of your life and now suddenly you have to have the talk not about the relationship but about the movie you're going to watch and how you treat each other like i won't watch your movie well i won't watch your movie Okay, that's called breaking up. So, <laughs> so get over it, uh, or you're over. And and then you can't be the only one to compromise. Uh, so you say Rocky tonight, and and uh, something romantic tomorrow night. And and if the transcendence is operating, you you don't even mind watching a movie. You ne you would never ring up yourself because you're watching it with someone who you love who loves it. So you get to sh you get to enjoy their loving it because you love them, not because you love it. Once in a while, someone will do something and you're like, oh my God, I thought I'd hate this, but I kind of like it. But even if you don't, who cares? You love the person who loves it. So you love it because you love them. Write that down, not for this class, for, for your life. So uh, I don't want the way the exhibition. I want the way out. There are passages to the right and passages to the left, but no exit sign. 
everywhere. The fingers point, and this is very judgy. You know, she's always being judged, and exhibition are always being judged, and women are always being judged. Uh, I touch the shoulder man walking in front of me. I say, I want the way out, but he points uh, to the placards, and his hand is made of steel. That reminds you we're in a dream, obviously, but also the, the machine, um, that it's hard and you, it, it doesn't break, it breaks you. So uh, I walk along with my head bent, very ashamed. That's really important, the way, the way hegemonic discourse uses shame. Like, what is the matter with you? Why can't you do what you're told? Why can't you do what everyone else does? Why don't you understand something that's common sense? Uh, well, maybe because none of those things are true. It's just that through consensus, that's what we're told is common sense, and that's what we're told we should do. It's very, it's very hard, especially if you're disenfranchised, like Sasha, when you're so smart that you you can see the wizard of, you can see the guy behind the curtain, you can see behind the Wizard of Oz, you can see behind the machinery of modernity. You know, you can see the rhizomatic. She's caught in the rhizomatic. She can't get. Up, she's underground in the subway. She's in the root system, and she's trapped there. It doesn't that kind of the insight that I try and bring to these lectures. Um, would not help me if I were homeless. Uh, uh, it wouldn't matter how brilliantly I could explain to you why I'm homeless. I would still be homeless. The reality is I'm a professor with a salary and a home, and I also work on the insights of machinery. Actually works, but I'm, I'm, in, I, I'm able to protect myself from the machine. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I can't say that I have impunity from it. I had to get tenure and I've had to do lots of things that I don't always want to do. Uh, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get chewed up. I'm not gonna get fired tomorrow. Uh, I, no one's gonna, you know, short of an invasion, no one's gonna take my house that I worked 20 years to pay for. So now it's my house, no mortgage. Um, so th these are things I can do. And what's kind of interesting about being a university professor is that I, I give you the point of view of the homeless person from a house where the mortgage is paid off. Um, because a homeless person's not gonna come in and lecture for A ten, but they may they may have insights equal to or better than than some of mine, not least of all because they might be experiential and, and not just theoretical and intellectual. Um, mind you, I didn't I was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth, but I wasn't born a uh, street corner either. Um so it points to the placards. I walk along with my head bent, very ashamed. So shame is a powerful way to control people who are trying to push back against the common sense so that they can keep, make room for themselves. So, uh, so all these ideas that, well, poor people just don't seem to want to succeed and, and you know, nothing about intergenerational trauma and, and drug use and uh, occasional uh, uh, police misconduct, which we literally see on YouTube. It, it, is like none of those things hold people back? Maybe they do. Uh, nope, no, they're just lazy. They don't seem to know how to apply themselves. It's, it's like, what world are you living in? But that's the world. That's the world. That's what William Bradshaw gets to say what the world is. And Septimus, who knows it's wrong, can't find any words that, that anybody has to listen to. Even though he does say the best line in the book, communication is health. That's Septimus. And he's going to get locked up as insane. Has, and it has to jump out a window. If it doesn't, is not healthy, uh, obviously, but in a weird way, it's the healthiest, it's the only healthy thing remaining for him to do, throw himself out the window rather than be locked up uh, like a cardboard box in a, in a hospital warehouse. Um, so anyway, very ashamed, just like me, she's thinking to herself, just like me, always wanting to be different from other people. The steel finger points along a long stone passage of steel, stone. I mean, there's no way you can make, this is not a stroll in the woods where you can say, oh, I want to go over here. I thought I saw a rabbit. No. Steel and stone. The steel finger points along a long stone past this way, this way, this way to the exhibition. And then another thing happens, and this is going to be, give us some insight into how Sasha's whole life has been uh, compromised to an extent by the early death of her father, uh, both in life and in this novel. The, the father seems to have died around eight, which when Sasha was around 18. And the family never liked her all that much, and she seems very bohemian to them. She, she won't do what they tell her either. So she's kind of been cut off from, the, the family wasn't uber wealthy, but she's kind of been cut off. The dad loved her and kind of 
kept an eye on her, but he, he died of a heart attack fairly suddenly. And she was kind of disinherited. Not exactly, but it, they kept dangling the money in front of her saying, oh, you can have this if you um, do what we say, when we say, how we say. And so eventually she stopped being willing to jump through hoops for the family money because unfortunately her father hadn't given her a trust fund in her own name. And she had this terrible aunt uh, who uh, did this constantly would dole out as little bit of the money as possible, even though the father left it to her, but he left the aunt as executor uh, because she wasn't quite of age when he died unexpectedly of a heart attack. So now a little man, this is going to probably be a father figure, with a snub nose, dressed in a long white nightshirt. But remember, the guy across the hallway has a long white nightshirt. And he keeps hanging out, and he's really, he's super creepy. So it's, it's uh, interesting that he's going to have an interaction with the fa with her father in this dream. Um, uh, so, he, so this guy in the long white shirt is talking earnestly to me. I am your father, he says. Uh, but blood is streaming from a wound in his forehead. Murder, he shouts. Murder, murder. Helplessly, I watch the blood streaming. At last, my voice tears itself loose from my chest. I too shout, murder, murder, help, help. Now, this is probably what it felt like to when he died of a heart attack, as it, it was like he had been killed. It wasn't actually murder, but it, it was sudden and uh, and absolute. And then her dead father was gone. So it, it seemed almost like someone had just murdered him. But she's confusing in her dream. She's confusing her father with this creepy guy across the way who actually seems to be eyeing her for a possible sexual encounter, which is not the way she feels about her father or the way her father felt about her. But this gives us insight into what Sasha's looking for. She all her life she's been looking for a man who could take care of her the way her father did i mean the, the, this concept of the issues is a cliche but there's there's for sasha it goes further than that i mean the way the way the father died the way the money got torn away from her she's looking for a substitute for her father and she expects them she expects them to be lovers too i mean she's, she's not like crazy but being their lover is is is, is one is fine because they're not literally her father uh, and, but what she doesn't seem to recognize is they're only going to see her as a lover. They're not going to see her as a metaphorical daughter. Um, and that love can be tricky, too, because when, when you're lovers, uh, you know, we want to be loved not necessarily like the parent did, but, but, but parents are often the model of, uh, of, of how, for better and for worse, how, what, what love is or what love is supposed to be. Um, so it's, you know, it's not unusual to, to feel sometimes in a relationship, like you want to say to the partner, like, you know, I'm not your father. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't afford this. Or, and they could e equally say, I'm not your mother. I'm sorry. I can't make the stupid pumpkin pie with the secret spices or that your mother can, you know, go eat her pumpkin pie. So both partners can get fed up with the occasional confusions of, uh, I want the comfort of my parents' love within their, our relationship as lovers. But again, in a relationship that's working, you don't mind doing some some of that. Like, let me, yeah, let me go mow the lawn like your dad used to, and uh, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll make you a nice pie. I know, because I love you. It's, it's, it goes back to that. I mean, love is so important because it's the only thing that keeps relationships from being vampire. Because vamp vampires don't love you, they drain your blood. And you don't drain the blood of someone you love. You might drain the blood of someone you don't love without being a horrible person. You may be using them up and not even realizing. So uh, that's where it's important to know whether is the, is the intimacy mutual or is one person giving and giving and giving and then you see the other one taking and taking. It's okay to take. It's okay to give. But it shouldn't be one or the other doing the giving or the taking exclusively. Um, and the very the very way you decide whether it's a give or take moment, what love is, since there's no way to chart it, you, you can't measure it, um, because you might mind, you might do six things for someone you love without worrying about it. You're not like, okay, that's six you owe me. You might do that on a first or second date or something, but you stop keeping count when you move from negotiation to intimacy because you feel like you really each love each other. The fact that I've five favors in a row it doesn't matter the law of averages will work out uh you do things for me who cares if the score is tied or not um so now oh so then he says murder murder i wake up and a man in the street outside is singing so important dream uh i would read and and reread 
that dream and, and this the second dream as well. Um, and from there we go to, uh, I'm gonna go to a memory of, a, of an earlier job and notice that the, the jobs she has also exhibit her. Uh, she's, because she was good looking, she was pretty, probably sexy and Jean Reese was certainly pretty. Um, and she worked as a chorus girl, Jean Reese did in her early years when she broke away from her family and she would tour with music hall companies. So, and she met a lot of wealthy married men who wanted to be her lover and in exchange for paying her rent and her gifts and buying her clothes and uh, you know, everything that happens in the first half of Pretty Woman, let's say. Um, so I had the job for three weeks. It was dreary, you couldn't read, they didn't like it. I would feel as if I were drugged just sitting there watching those damned dolls, there's a bunch of dolls thinking, what a success they would have made of their lives if they had been women. Satin skin, silk hair, velvet eyes, sawdust heart, all complete to envy the commissaire because at least he could watch the people passing in the street. But that's, that's a very telling line about gender roles. It's easier to be a woman, it's easier to perform as feminine if you are a doll. Um, I mean, that used to, maybe it still is, but you're such a doll, used to be slang and for a beautiful woman. Maybe we don't say that much. I don't call my wife a doll anyway. But uh, to have a sawdust heart, to not care, to be able to just perform and perform. These dolls just sit there all day, like the, like the American girl dolls. They look, they look cute and great 24 seven. You can sneak in in the middle of the night and turn on a flashlight and they're like, hi, I'm cute. So, or Barbie. So Barbie is it, it, interesting too, because Barbie's, always got an 18 inch waister and always can wear high heels and never gets old. And just the only you know shortcoming is she's injected plastic. But um, so on the other hand, he had to stand up all the time. So, so that's another telling moment of what she has gone through uh, and can, you know, it can really be an issue with uh, in the cities, especially Again, people will talk about it, but but to get a job at the cosmetics counter of Holt Renfrew, um, they're going to be looking for a certain type. They're trying to sell makeup. So not only will you want to look good in makeup, and, and again, I'm not saying you, that means you're not smart. And because you know, being a good makeup artist or say this woman is, is, is a skill, but look sell too. So there's a, there'll always be that uh, advantage. and this from the fair and lovely ads and in, in fact most of the cosmetic ads they wind up saying you will get a better job uh, with lighter skin redder lips um, perfectly trimmed eyebrows and, and so on for women especially uh, your look your, your stock your your you have a bottom line pardon the pun you have a, a, an asset I'm gonna stop with the puns you you um, you're on the market and Sasha's is aging so her market value amongst women is going down and, and she totally notices that when the when the guy who hits on her is a gigolo looking for a client and to sees an older woman um not a not a wealthy married man who wants to pamper uh, a beautiful young mistress um so then there's an incident that's really important when the owner of the shop and she calls him Mr. Blank, and I don't think that's his name. But he's he's really an it's really an anatomy of a fascist. He's, he happens to be British, but he, he's a fascist patriarch. And he comes to visit his shop, and she knows she kind of knows she doesn't know how it's going to happen, but she knows he's going to chew her up and spit her out because that makes him feel good. And he doesn't know who she is. He she doesn't even know she'll be there, but he just senses her the way a snake. He's a bird and he knows and, and he gets a chance. Uh, I think we saw, saw this a lot in the Trump era that, that men feeling good because they can chew up things, other people, uh, bills, uh, whatever, and immigrants certainly um, separate families, throw people in cages. It, the, it's, it's a horrible game because the people who do stuff like that and, and are, are hollow inside and no amount of cruelty is ever going to make them feel better but they always are convinced that a continued and a deeper cruelty might yet bring them some sense of self-regard and it never will uh, and then they get so invested in like like what Kurtz finally has to realize they get so invested in breaking people 
to feel better themselves that they can't imagine stopping and just like Dorian Gray he he can't undo the painting all the people he's brutalized in a vain pathetic ultimately useless he he gained nothing when he sticks that knife in the painting the only thing the only difference between the 18 year old who hadn't experienced life yet and the ugly old man on the floor is it is it's an ugly old man he had he never lived he has no experiences um so this is how what what goes down is you know, she's so timid and so afraid of uh, of upsetting the big boss man that, that he tells her to go to the case uh, and his French is not very good and she he said he mispronounces it so it actually sounds like um, a name in a, in a mailbox that she has to find and she can't it's a lot like her dream she's wandering around like this way to the mailbox she cannot find it so she finally comes back and says I couldn't find it. And he says, the cashier, you couldn't find the cashier. And he finally says the word right. And the cashier would just be down the hall. And she goes, oh, uh, y yes. Uh, and then here's the, the scene. Um, and he starts taking a closer look at her. How long have you been working here? About three weeks. Where was your last job? I worked at the Maison Shows. Oh, really? You worked for shows, did you? You worked for shows. Were you receptionist there? No, I said, I worked as a mannequin. That would have been a model, you know, back in the day, women would come out dressed in the dress you were interested in buying and they would pirouette for you and go back in. So there weren't dressing rooms per se. Um, I mean, they may, there probably were, but you, you get a little fashion show in the, in the better stores where the, and that's, that would be your job all day is put on the dress that the lady, and it was a great, good way to sell dresses because the mannequins were, would have these great figures, obviously. So when they came out and twirled in the dress, it, both the man and possibly the woman were like, wow, that's, that's really a great dress. Um, which isn't to say it won't look good on me, but it's, it's like everything's going to look good on a top model. Um, you worked as a mannequin. And notice how subtle this is. Down and up, his eyes go up and down. How long ago it was? So we, we can read, he's like, you're too old. And she's right, because then she has to say, how long ago was it? Now everything is a blank in my head. Years, days, hours, everything. It's a blank in my head. How long ago was it? I don't know. And she says four, nearly five years ago. So she's confirming his suspicion, which is you couldn't be a mannequin or a model now. You're too old. How long did you stay there? About three months, I said. He seems to be waiting for further information. And then I left, I said in a high voice. Decidedly, this is one of my good days. This is one of the days when I say everything right. Oh, you left. Yes, I left. And then she's now she's talking to herself. Yes, my dear, I left. I got bored and I walked out on them. But that was four, nearly five years ago, and a lot can happen in five years. I haven't the slightest intention of walking out on you. I can assure you of that. And I hope you haven't the slightest intention of, and just the thought that you may have the slightest intention of, makes my hands go cold and my heart beat, but you know, fire me. But basically, he's saying, five years ago, I was beautiful enough to walk out of the job that bored me. Uh, five years later, I don't have that option. Uh, I, in fact, not only do I not have that option, I'm terrified you'll fire me. And he kind of does as this, as this scene goes on. Um, and then that she, she recalls something else and or from her past, but I want to skip to where the scene continues, uh, with the, with the whole problem with the cash. Um, I don't. So she goes back and says, I can't find it. Uh, extraordinary, he says, very slowly. Quite extraordinary. God knows I'm used to fools, but this complete imbecility. This woman is the biggest fool I've ever met in my life. She seems to be half-witted. She's hopeless, well, isn't she? He says to Salvatini, who's the guy who takes care of the shop when the guy's not there. Salvatini makes a rolling movement of his head, which means I quite agree with you, or not so bad as you think, or oh my God, what's all this about? So she's humiliated. I mean, that that's like Dorian Gray, without your heart, you're nothing. Uh, no, uh, so and then all of her, her, she says not to cry in front of this man, just walk out of the room. No, wait a minute, you better take that note along. You do know who to take it now, don't you? The cashier, yes, he stares at me. Something else has come into his eyes. Now here's the fascist term. He knows how I am feeling. Yes, he knows. Just a hopeless, helpless little fool, aren't you? He said, 
jovial, bantering, on the surface, yes. Underneath, no, I don't think so. I don't think so either. Well, aren't you? Yes, 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 oh yes, I burst into tears. I have any baggage. I mean, that is so humiliating. You're a stupid, bit worthless fool. Well, aren't you, aren't you? It's not even enough to say those insulting things. You make the other person commit this act of self loathing like yes i'm all those horrible things you say it's incredible it's abusive it's total verbal abuse dear me mr blank says what a this guy is no he, he pushes it he knows brutalizes her and then he's like oh my god you're crying what the hell uh i rush away from them into a fitting room and it is hardly ever used i cry for a long time for myself for the old woman with the bald head in his earlier scene for all the sadness of this damned world for all the fools and all the defeated. This, and this, these are the people most vulnerable to fascism. I mean, Hitler in 1936 had already begun to uh, exterminate the handicapped. And if you look at my notes in the discussion section, I have some of the placards where he said, you know, we need to kill handicapped people because they use up much tax dollars. I mean, they're, they're just zero. I mean, he didn't advertise it specifically like that. And he was kind of quiet about it, but he wanted to use he, and he in fact did. He sterilized women who were seemed to um, have too low an IQ. We didn't want them to reproduce children who might have a low IQ as well. And he started killing the elderly uh, that were taking up too much resources, and they obviously weren't going to be going back to work. So it was better to kill them and take the savings and put it toward uh, the machinery of war, because Germany. A lot of the money that Germany got to build the, that that machinery of war that just tore into Poland, tore through France, is things like killing their elderly um, and and saving money that way, and uh, just no humanity, no community. Um, so he comes. Now I have stopped crying. Now I shall never have that dress. And she thinks about it. If I had the right dress, if I had been wearing it, I should never have stammered or been stupid. So even though we, uh, Sasha is very clear on the absurdity and the unfairness of having to perform as feminine, she also relies on it. And she feels like, you know, I made a mistake. If I was wearing a dress that let me perform as sexy, then he would have not done this. He saw me as a slightly older woman, didn't have the dress I knew would make me maybe look younger, maybe it was tighter, maybe lower cut, whatever it was that would have distracted him into saying, okay, this, this woman's sex, so I guess it's all right. Because uh, you do get the feeling that when he comes in, he's, he's mad because he's trying to sell dresses and he would rather have a supermodel uh, ushering people into the room, although he's not paying enough at all for, for any highly attractive woman to take the job. Um, now the circle is complete. Now, strangely enough, I'm no longer afraid of Mr. Blank. Uh, and then he looks at me with distaste. And now, one of the, again, one of my favorite paragraphs in the novel, she, she doesn't say any of this out loud. In fact, after she does this, she, she guts him uh, like a stuck pig, but only in her mind. Doesn't say any of this to him, even though he deserves to hear all of it. And at the end of it, she says, did I say any of this? No, I didn't even think it. So she wasn't even able come up with she's terrified she's like a it's just a deer in the headlight later she's very smart and she will go through exactly what's really going on with mr blank and that's where this novel is amazing because it doesn't seem political but this is a political analysis of what how fascists get off to put it bluntly um well let's argue this out mr blank you who represent society have the right to pay me 400 francs a month that's my market value for i am an efficient member of society slow in the uptake uncertain slightly damaged in the fray notice she's comparing it to like a hat that's on sale because it got knocked around so it's in the remainders she's in the remainders bin you know, like you go into walmart in these movies you would hope that you don't have to watch when you're in hell are being sold for a dollar each then those movies have just gone into the Remainder bin, um, because their market value is zilch. No one wants to see them, and everyone knows they're awful. So, um, so you have that right uh, to pay me that, because that's my market value. So notice we're back to the Auden issue here of market value is, in, is, is just one metric. So that she's trying to be kind of fair, like, 
I have a really low market, but I'm a human being. Um, and and if, 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 you know, she has a low GPA, if you want to put it that way, so she can't get into places. Uh, that doesn't mean she doesn't have a lot to offer and because there's more than graduate school. There's, there's loving and there's compassion and there's caring and nurturing and none of those things uh, are, are intri intimately connected with the, the how much education you have um, or money or possessions. Um, so she goes, sorry, she goes on to, to keep this anatomy going. Um, so lodge me in a small dark room. Uh, to clothe me shabbily, to harass me with words and monotony and unsatisfying longing, till you get me to the point where I blush at a look, cry at a word. Now, this is an example of the precarious economy. We now call this the economy of precarity. All these, everyone keeps saying, oh, 10,000 new jobs were added. Yeah, where? Part-time jobs at Walmart. I, I don't have a problem with that, except it's, there's no benefits. Um, it's minimum wage, which they keep keeping down as if they were to raise minimum wage the whole world would fall apart when these billionaires are wandering around. Paying someone 18 bucks an hour is not going to bring the world down. And COVID proved that. It, the people out on the front line risking their health so that everyone else can go get their hamburger or, or whatever it is, they dry cleaning, whatever. Um, they're being paid almost nothing. The ones on the front lines, the, the ones who have the most to lose. And nurses and doctors, they make a, they make a bit more, but there's a lot of orderlies in hospitals. There's a lot of people in hospitals that make minimum wage. And there, COVID doesn't give a damn what your salary is if you're in its proximity. So these people are heroes, and, and they, they're visible now to us if we, if we care to look. They, they have work ethic. Um, they get by with less than I do. Uh, they care, they love, they try, they love their families. Um, so this idea that, you know, you're worthless because uh, I only, because you accept my offer of minimum wage, so that means you're not worth much. So isn't it so, Mr. Blank? There must be the dark background to show up the bright colors. Some must cry so that the others may be able to laugh the more heartily. Sacrifices are necessary. Let's say that you have this mystery right to cut my legs off, but the right to ridicule me afterwards because I am a cripple? No. That I think you haven't got. So you cannot cut someone's legs off and then laugh because you can't walk. But that's what fascists do. They brutalize, they impoverish, and then they laugh at you. And they say that you're funny and worthless. Uh, and that makes them feel big and powerful. And, and, and she makes that point that you don't have the right to do that. And that's the right you hold most dearly, isn't it? You must be able to despise the people you exploit. That's a lie out of Karl Marx, uh, except with that ad. And we saw that in the Congo, too. the natives are being worked to death. So they're beneath contempt as far as the workers uh, are concerned. You must be able to despise the people you exploit. But I wish you a lot of trouble, Mr. Blank. And just to start off with your damn shops going bust. Hallelujah. Did I say all this? Of course, I didn't. I, yeah, I didn't even think it. I then said, I'm ill. I want to go get it in first. And he says he quite agrees. It would be the best thing. No regrets, he says. No regrets. So she's fired at this point. And there I am, out in the avenue. My month's pay, 400 francs. And the air is so sweet. As it can only be in Paris, it is autumn and the dry leaves are blowing along, swing high, swing low, swing to and fro. It's a wonderful ending in a way because part of her is freaked out. She has, she's got 400 francs and no job. So she's not immediately in trouble, but how's she going to get another job? And at the same time, she's thrilled. She's out of this dusty place and it's a beautiful day in, in Paris. And that's where the market system can, can literally um, mold your experience. You walk outside, it's a beautiful day, but you didn't do very well in your midterm and you're worried you won't get into grad school, worried you won't get a good job. And this good day just blows right past you. It's, it's, it, and the person behind you is feeling good and they're like, oh my God, this is the best day ever. And, and hopefully you'll have other days where that happens, but our moods are dictated by the market. Like, does it, is the value of your house up or down? Is the value of your stocks up or down? Did you get a, a raise or not? Um, and the market's invisible. I mean, and yet 
you look around you in a subway and everybody's face is reflecting the pressure of the market. Karl Marx said rather famously, everybody walks around with 50, under 50,000 pounds of pressure per square inch, but does anyone feel it? Well, we do, but then we don't. And, and so we come down with anxiety and migraines and sore backs and um, the, you know, various injuries that are kind of the result of having enormous weight put on us that we're, that we're not allowed to identify as enormous weight. Um, so they double your workload or, or, or you have to take a second job. And it's like, yeah, fine, that's what you gotta do. And your body pays a price, your, your moods, your, uh, your emotions, they all pay a price. And if it goes too far, you get depressed and then even nice things don't um, make an impression and can be really vicious spiral. Um, so let's, uh, let's jump ahead a little, or quite a bit more, because I, I don't want to keep the lecture going on and on. Yeah, but the architecture of the city, Reese makes it very clear, is set up to, to impose a kind of classes. I don't know if you've noticed downtown, wherever there's a place in, in some of the, at least in the nicer parts of town, wherever, wherever there's a place where somebody might be able to lie down, they just put jagged, they either put a, a metal spear or, or, or rough rock and they're basically like they're saying they wreck it as a place you could actually lay down and sleep and that's a small example because they don't want a homeless person there same, they do the same thing with pigeons you put you just put sharp spiky things in the gutter so they they can't roost and and uh you know poop all over the place um and you know the it, like if you think about it where would you take a nap downtown and without and short a room nowhere even though there's lots of space um you, you go into a foyer or you go into a hotel you go into a bank there's an amazing amount of space but it's all it's already been zoned it's zoned for money uh it's if you're in a bank you should be there to, to be doing something with money not take a nap um and when you look around at the modern city it's set up for commerce uh everything is set up for commerce, and you got to keep moving. And you're walking past plate glass windows, and every look into a window is is also an exchange. Like, can you afford that purse? Can you afford that dress? Do you want it? Do you think it might um, improve things for you? Why? So, modern life is a, is a constant circulation and exchange where the commodities dictate the degree to which you can feel good about yourself. Uh, Again, reading poetry helps because poetry is not like that. It's, it, poetry is intimate. It's not a negotiation. That's also why it's not easy. Um, it's more important than easy. It, it, it's, uh, it gets you in touch with a, with a part of yourself that's not available to the market. Um, okay, so then she goes to buy a hat. And, and again, it's very unsettling event because she's trying to get a hat that will protect her from all of her anxieties and from everything that the, the way people are looking at her uh and so this the shop lady says all my clients are complaining that the hats now are very difficult to wear but i think i am sure i shall manage to suit you in the glass it seems to me that i have the same demented expression as the woman up the street my god not that one i stare suspicious at her in the glass. Is she laughing at me? No, I think not. I think she has the expression of someone whose pride is engaged. This is a sales clerk. She has determined that before I go out of the shop, I shall admit that she can make hats. As soon as I see this expression in her eyes, I decide to trust her. I too become quite calm. Now, that's so different than Mr. Black. You know, because that's commu communication. I mean, she's still a businesswoman who, who makes hats, and what, not like Lucrezia and Mrs. Dow, she makes hats. She wants to sell hats. That's her business. But she's there's a bit of compassion and connection here. Like, I'm not going to sell you a hat that makes you look stupid. I'm a good enough hat maker that I can have it both ways. I can sell my hat and make my living, and you can have a hat that makes you feel good. Like, we can do that. I'm not ripping you off. So I stare suspiciously. Okay, you know, I'm bewildered. Please tell me which one I ought to have, how that she trusts the woman. The first one I showed you, she says at once. Oh my God, not one. Or perhaps the third one. When I put the third one, when I put on the third one, she says, I don't want to insist, but yes, yeah, that is your hat. I look at it doubtfully and she watches me, not mockingly, but anxiously. See, that's important. And Sasha's uh, antenna for being mocked is like through the roof. I mean, she's so, rejection hurts her so much. She's so traumatized by rejection and she's terrified 
uh, someone's going to look at her and, and do the Mr. Blank thing again. Um, but this woman's not doing that. She says, walk up and down in the room in it. See whether you feel happy in it. What a nice thing to say. See whether you'll get accustomed to it. There is no one else in the shop. It is quite dark outside. We are alone celebrating this extraordinary ritual. So it's a, it is a moment of contact between two women, which is also unusual in this novel. And Reese makes the point that it's often hard for women to feel friendly with other women because women are pitted against one another. Um, so that even if you're at a club scene, that then the value of the women when it's attached to merely the way they look is going to be a relative value. Like who's the hottest woman in the room? Or who's the next hottest? And it's very if if the women to the degree that the women feel a little like that that they're that they're a seven because they're standing next to a six and then, but they're also a seven because the person on the woman on the other side is an eight and and uh this is the way women can be made to feel like that they're being pragged on uh, on the market and the, whatever a seven is for a woman is is going to be relative to all the other women in the room it's not it's there's nothing it's obviously there's nothing intrinsic about any given woman. So it's very, women are made to feel competitive to one another on, on the open marketplace. And not just a meat market, although that's a telling phrase, obviously. Um, some bars are called meat markets because they seem to just be hookup joints. But even if they're not hookup joints, there they still can be a market. And, and one thing the Hollywood romance does, I'll just preview the class, tries to figure out how to make women feel like this, that they are not the result of a market exchange when they finally find their lover. That's why this, that's why problems happen in novels like Pretty Woman, which I'll be analyzing, uh, where you know, and see your prostitute fall in love. It's an incredible formula that that can even happen. And at one point, Richard Gere says, you know, you and I have a lot of like, well, you and I are a lot of like, we both screw people for money. But that's the theme of the movie, that how do we get out of this? He's like, I'm a prostitute too. And you're a prostitute. I'm a much better paid prostitute. And I don't even have to have sex. But the dynamics the same. And he's lonely and cut off from himself. Um, and there's also huge feminist issues that we cover in that movie, by the way. That, that this is not what, with this conversion of Julia Roberts into the love of the of Gears Light is fraught with problems because she doesn't have any power. And he could walk off away from her at any point. He still has all the money. Um, okay, so uh, we continue with her various adventures and she continues to, to show um, uh, the, the, the way the world has become uh, a giant market. Um, and, and meanwhile, in the middle, somewhere threaded through this book is, is the the relationship with Renee is this a romance? Uh, at first, it seems very obvious that it's a, a market exchange. Um, then Renee seems to be really making a point that you think of it that way. Although really, she wants she does pay for some of the dinners, and uh, so it's really hard to tell uh, whether it is is Renee accept. And this becomes one of the big points in the novel. Is so she says good night. I'm going up to my room. He says, well, I want to go with you. He says, no, I don't want you to. And he says, why are you like this? You know, why, uh, why do you play these games? I don't want to play these games. And she's like, good night. I'll see you. So she goes up the stairs. And then somehow, I'm not totally sure. He must have taken another staircase. But he's up there. And she's super happy. It's like a Hollywood romance. Like, And he grabs her. And they, have, they kiss passionately. And she's like, it's happened. It's happened. I'm happy. I'm happy. And they're going to spend the night. I think, and she's like, oh my God, he loves me. And and then things start to go a little bit sour. It's not, and again, it's so hard to tell. He says something like, you, did, you knew I was going to come up here, didn't you? And that starts to rub her the wrong way. Like, he's kind of like, you know, you were just playing with me. You wanted to have sex with me. And, and she tries to push back against it, but it gets more and more, she starts to feel more and more like, oh my God, um, this was a this was a negotiation all the time he's this is not a romance and she says you have to go and he, he's like you i'm sick of your games and, and he essentially comes close to uh, date raping her until he um uh it, it, until she tells him look i have a thousand francs in my pocket 
you don't have to have sex with me to earn it because you're just a gigolo. You're just an object. Why? I'm, I'm telling you, I don't want you to perform the service you perform. You don't have to have for money because that's what you are, a guy who has sex for money. So she really tears into him. And, and, and does he deserve it? It's hard to tell. There's, there, there's, there's the beginning of something like a disconnect here. Um, and so she's, and she says a bunch of, you know, really vicious things because she's so hurt and vulnerable. And she says things like, uh, of course, I understand. I said, actually, I understand. I should be an awful fool if I did. If you look at the right hand pocket of the dressing case over on that table, you'll find the money you want. He looks over my wrists. I feel him go very still because now he's like hurt because she's going to start insulting him. It isn't locked. Take the thousand franc note. But for God's sake, leave me the others, or I'll be in an awful jam. But how heavy he is, how much heavier than one would have thought. You mustn't think, I say, that I'm vexed about anything because I'm not. Everybody's got their living to earn, haven't they? I'm just trying to save you a lot of trouble. Don't listen. This is how she's talking to herself. Don't listen. That's not me speaking. Don't listen. Nothing to do with me. I swear it. So th this is painful. Like, there's still another, still a part of her saying that, you know, he's there's some kind of affection here, if, if not you know, something more in exchange. There's in, she thinks there could be intimacy here. So part of her is saying, this is just an exchange. Just get the hell out. And then inside, she's saying, I think I'm wrong. I think I'm not giving you a chance. I think I'm just destroying uh, possibly a, a human connection. And so don't listen to that woman, even though the woman is, is her. Uh, and I thought you were Awfully sweet to me, I say. I loved all the various stories you told me about yourself, especially that one about your wounds and your scars. That amused me very much. I put my arm up over my face because I have a feeling that he's going to hit me. I'm just trying to save you a whole lot of trouble, I say. A whole lot of waste of time. You can have the money right away. So it'd be a waste of time, wouldn't it? His weight is not on me any longer. He's standing up. He's moved so quickly that I haven't had time to put my arms around him or to say, stay, to say, don't do this. Don't leave me like this. Don't. She doesn't say any of that. Yes, you're right, he says. It would be a waste of time. You and your wounds. Don't you see how funny you are? You did make me laugh. Now, she's also handing on the abuse that Mr. Blank gave to her. You know, hurt people hurt people. People who are hurt hurt because they one way to deal with the pain is to dish it at someone else and watch them writhe in pain in the way that you did earlier it's a terrible it, it, it's a terrible thing because it just like the farrington when he went in dublin as i went home and beat his kid. um but it's it's terribly tempting to the short term relief from being humiliated is to humiliate someone else the the the, the much better idea is, is to because Dorian Gray got humiliated by his grandfather and then by Lord Henry and then by, and so he just goes around humiliating other people. You, you, what you don't pass back, you pass on. So if you're treated with contempt and you don't find, figure out that you, you need to give the contempt back to the people who imposed it on you, otherwise you're going to impose it on someone. So don't, don't internalize contempt. When, when someone treats you with contempt, what they think of you, it's none of your business. It's their problem. Um, because contempt is never right. We're all human. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It happens all the time. But when someone is looking at you with contempt, they have crossed the line, not you. And that's what she knows that's true with Mr. Blank. But it still hurts her because she can't do anything about it. So I shall laugh every time I think about you. Then he leaves. And then what she needs to do is at one point is uh she says when he is gone i turn over on my side and huddle up making myself as small as possible and here's where she's a little girl and we realize that once again she's missed her father and missing being treated with the kind of security that father would give i cry in the way that hurts right down that hurts your heart and your stomach who is this crying she's so she's, she's dissociated she's like watching herself um the same one who laughed on the landing kissed him and was happy this is me, this is myself who's crying. The other, how do I know who the other is? She isn't me. And so the happy girl that was so happy on the landing, she decides that's not me. Although there's a confusion here. She's like, which one am I? Am I the happy girl on the landing?
ending or am I the one crying my eyes out? And she kind of feels like I'm the one crying my eyes out because she's been traumatized and she gets so easily triggered that she can't hang in there in the present, in the moment, figure out what's going on with Renee. Uh, is there something there? And if not, find someone that where there is. I mean, you know, people talk about my picker is broken. It's kind of something I've seen in shows where if if you're on your, the third relationship with someone who's in, who seems to be the twin or the triplet of the other two, you have to ask yourself, how do I keep picking the same person even though they have a different name? What, what and in her case, it's not, it, the problem is she's looking for a father figure who's also a lover, and she sometimes is just getting lovers who see a chance to use someone because they have daddy issues, and then and then possibly they don't mind and they don't want to use you, but she's so triggered. Um, by by assuming they're going to use her uh, because she feels so usable uh, and has been abused that that even if it's not true she'll make it happen and and that's often the case in a relationship is that if you're convinced that you, that you can't be loved you won't believe it when it happens and and no one who loves you will be able to get through but you also have to be careful you can't just lay yourself wide open to anyone who says they love you. Uh, because they could be a user. So it's, I mean, the only difference between a, an attentive lover, there is no difference between an attentive lover in the early stages of dating and a stalker. I mean, the stalkers will bring you flowers every day. A, an attentive lover will bring you flowers every day. When do you know things are going south? Well, when they, when, if, if you, the guy stops bringing you flowers and starts going through your garbage and wants to know where you are, then you got a stalker. Stalkers, the only difference between a, 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 an attentive lover and a stalker is whether you love them or not. Now, I mean, that's, that's a joke in a way, because stalkers obviously, what's weird is once they start acting like stalkers, you don't feel loved at all because you realize that you're just a thing. And they just, they've just imposed, you're, you're the fetish object for them. And it doesn't matter who you are, what you say or how you look, they're, you're just a possession. And, and all this attention they're giving you is just because they're broken and decided you the piece that will fix them which has nothing to do with you and they will break you to fit that piece if you, if you can't get out um but then the, in the final movement uh of uh of the book she says well go on look might as well know and, and by this what she means is did he take the money and it's weird because there's a scene just like that in pretty woman after he's told his friend at the polo uh, thing that, that, that uh, she's a, a prostitute. And, and then the guy comes up and says, maybe I can get a piece. And are you busy? And she's mortified. She's horrified. And he doesn't, he says, well, I just state the obvious. I mean, you are a prostitute. She goes, I didn't have my armor on. It's very, it's a very Jean Reese moment with Julie Roberts there, where she's like, when I'm being a prostitute, I know I'm being a prostitute and I perform and I don't get hurt because I'm closed off. And, but I was at a polo match. I like you. Um, you should show me to your friends. I, I was proud. And then you told your friend I was, that I was a whore so that he could come up and say, I want to buy you. I mean, you know, that was a terrible thing that he did. And, and when, and she's leaving and, but notice when he, he, he goes back in the room, she's left all the money on the bed. That's, and that's when he comes out and says, I, I was jealous. I didn't like it that that guy was paying attention. I still don't think that's enough, frankly. Um, but it's it's weirdly like the scene, except that Richard Gere is the all powerful person in this movie. So he goes in and it's like, she didn't take the money. So she wasn't having sex with me for money. And I guess I might have feelings for her too. And so he comes back out um, and the movie continues from there. Anyway, go on, look, you might as well know. I feel in the right hand pocket, take the money out and look at it. 200 franc notes plus a thousand, a mill note. So in other words, she, she said, take the mill note and leave me the other two, but they're all there, all three are there. He didn't take the money. Well, what a compliment, who'd have thought it? I knew, I say, I knew, that's why I cried. I get the tooth glass and half fill it with whiskey. And she's really drunk, by the way, at this point. So this is, she's really practically passing out. Here's to you, gigolo, chic gigolo, I bow deeply. Have another, I have another. I appreciate this sweet gigolo from the depths of my heart. I'm not used to these courtesies. So here's to you, and here's to you. In a way she can't 
fully allow the moment that uh, that she hurt his feelings and he wasn't, I'm not saying he was unproblematic, but he didn't take the money. That's just, and she realizes that they could have at least maybe talked some more or, uh, but then again, he jump on top of her and that's a problem. I am very drunk. I see the Russian's face and his mouth moving, saying, Madame Venus Safasha. Oh, her, I say, what do I care about her? She's never done anything for me except play me a lot of dirty tricks. A hum of voices talking, but all you can hear is fem, 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 noise of a train saying Paris, 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 Paris. And then she has a hallucination, pretty much. All that is left in the world is an enormous machine made of white steel. And remember, the finger was steel of the guy who kept saying this way to the exhibition, this way to the exhibition. Long, thin arms. At the end of each arm is an eye. The eye flashes stiff with mascara. So these are women's eyes. They're made up to, 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 with cosmetics. So this is where the women become like robots, like machines, like they have to get made up and then they uh, have to perform and then they feel like uh, things and objects uh, to be bought, sold, compared, bartered, um, and uh, exploited. Um, when I look more closely, I see that only some of the arms have these eyes have lights. The arms that carry the eyes and the arms that carry the lights are all extraordinarily flexible and very beautiful. So the lights are like the spotlight and then the other eyes and the other weavy things are women in the spotlight performing for the spotlight. Uh, that takes us all the way back to the R.A.M. song. That's me in the corner. That's me in the spotlight. Um, but the gray sky, which is the background, terrifies me. Now, this is the coming war. And the arms wave to the accompaniment of music and of song like this, hacha, hacha, hacha. And I know the music, I can sing the song. I have another drink, damned voice in my head. I'll stop you talking. I'm walking up and down the room. She has gone. I am alone. That, that woman who was, uh, you know, was having that hallucination. And and she was probably drinking absinthe, which was illegal for, for a while. It's not even, I guess it has alcohol in it. I don't know all the properties, but it's a, it's a known, it's a different property. You don't just get drunk. You, you can kind of hallucinate it. It's not LSD. It, it, it has certain properties, maybe a little like um, mushrooms. Some, uh, it's something in the, it's made out of wormwood or something and that that can just, you know, bend the mind a bit. Um, it isn't such a long time since he left. Put your coat on and go after him. It isn't too late. It isn't too late for the last time. For the last time, I can't dear enough because I'm too proud or anything like that because my legs feel funny. So she's too drunk to, to walk. Come back, come back, I say like that over and over again. You must come back. You shall come back. I'll force you to come back. No, that's wrong. I mean, please come back. I beg you to come back. I press my hands up in my eyes and I see him. He is walking along the Boulevard Michel towards Montparnasse thinking, sad, femme, ridiculous woman. Come back, come back. Come back, come back, I say. He doesn't hear. He's walking along as quickly as he can. He is cold and vexed. You don't like men and you don't like women either. This is what he's saying. Like nothing, nobody. Oh, a monster. But why the gesture of not taking the money? I argue it was simply ridiculous. You know you're regretting it. Go back and get it. You could walk in and you could say, I forget something. I forgot something. I can walk out again. Come back, come back, come back. And then she keeps, she starts imagining that he's turned and he's walking back and she's waiting for him to knock. And then she says, I've got all my clothes on, I think. How stupid. I undress very quickly. I am. He takes, now he's turning into the end of the street. Very clear he is in my head. He's turning into the end of my street. I see the houses. Of course, she can't see any of this. She's just seeing it in her mind. I get into bed. I lie there trembling. I am very tired. Not me. No, don't worry. It's my brain. It's so tired. Don't worry about that. No more brain. I think how awful I must look. I must put the light out, but it doesn't matter. Now I am simple and not afraid. Now I am myself. He can look at me if he wants to. I'll only say, you see, I cried like that because you went away like the little girl. Or did I cry like that because I'll never sing again because the light in my brain has gone out. Now he has come up the hotel. He presses the button and the door opens. He's climbing up the stairs. Now the door is moving. The door is opening wide. I put my arm over my eyes. He comes in. He shuts the door after him. I lie very still with my arm over my eyes, as still 
as if I were dead. Now here comes this um, remarkable moment because somebody has come in the room. See, she actually does hear the door open. She actually does hear the door shut. Is it Renee? No. It's that guy across the hall who has been eyeing her in a creepy way for months. I don't need to look. I know. I think, is it the blue dressing gown or the white one? That's the gowns that he wears. That's very important. I must find that out. It's very important. You know, why is it very important? Not entirely clear. He had the white dressing gown on in dream where he said, I am your father. So there could be some kind of, I mean, she's very drunk and, and has already hallucinated. So there's some kind of switch. Like if he, uh, if he has the white dressing gown in my confusion, um, it's not that I'm not going to fantasize that I'm having sex with my father, but I can fantasize that some person cares for me because then, you know, it's like, why would she not scream and say, get out of the room? Because that she doesn't, what comes next is, is hard to n interpret. I take my arm away from my eyes. It is the white dressing girl. He stands there looking down at me, not sure of himself, his mean eyes flickering. He doesn't say anything. Thank God he doesn't say anything because she's going to let him come to bed with her, which, you know, is on the one hand is shocking, right? I mean, they don't have a relationship. Uh, what is she doing? And, and there's really, there's two possible interpretations that are virtually opposite. One this is an act of self denigration that she's saying I'm worthless. And if some guy wants to just wander in and have sex with me, that's all I'm worth. But I don't think that's the only possible explanation. There's something, you know, this whole novel, she's been looking for uh, connection and compassion. Now, can this guy do that? And no, that doesn't seem very likely. The, the real question is, is, is she giving up? Is this a practically a suicidal gesture? Or is this a turn toward some kind of uh, grounded beginnings of a, of a rejuvenation, um, of uh, accepting things as are, of, of being in the moment? And it, I can't tell you, to be honest, that to some extent, which of those is true will have something to do with how you experience the novel. I lean on, I don't think she's done. I think she's too resilient to, to, to perform the denigrating act and then be suicidal. But I can't prove that. Like, like I, just like I can't prove the end of the dead very much. I think Gabriel's going to be different, but I can't point to the sentence in this, in the story that says that. That's what great literature does. It emotes, it evokes, it incites. It, it doesn't inform. It's not dogmatic. He doesn't say anything. Thank God he doesn't say anything. I look straight into his eyes, and this is problematic too, and despise another poor devil of a human being for the last time. And I can go, again, I can go either way, like I'm done with life. This is the, or I'm gonna stop despising human beings. And, and I'm going to actually just make, whatever this is, I'm gonna have this contact last time. Then I put my arms around him and pull him down onto the bed saying, yes, yes, yes. Now that is the ending of James Joyce's Ulysses too. Molly Bloom pulls down her husband and says, yes, yes, yes. So another thing that's going on here is this whole novel has been saying that uh, women saying yes is, is not the joyful celebration that, that seems somewhat implied in, in uh, James Joyce's version this this presumption that women uh, want to give in or or want to submit and are thrilled at saying yes yes the harlequin romance i mean that's the stereotype about women in love is, it, is that they say no but they mean yes which is wrong uh, or even if it's right you take it at face value if a woman says no she said no and the only way it's not no is if she says i didn't mean no I changed my mind. I meant yes. Anything less than that is still no. So that's, you know, informed consent is not rocket science. And you might feel, you know, as a, as a guy, you might feel a trick. Maybe you got invited to the room and then she said, no, you still have zero rights to, uh, to, to insist on anything. She can change her mind. She can change her mind after you're in the bed. You might not want to ever see her again, but you should still get out. Um, that's, that's the way we treat other people, uh, uh, we listen to what they say, and, and 
if they are confused later and say, I don't know why I said no, can we go out again? Fine. But you treat them with, as for what they say. Uh, if they put up a boundary, it's their, that's their boundary. Uh, but so, so to some degree, this whole novel has been a pushback against Harlequin romance or what we would now might call Hollywood romance. That, that the, the whole point is the, and yet, this is really what complicates it. There is a part of her that wants to find her father again. And, and if she did, she would quote unquote submit, but not, not sexually, but she would be so happy to let him take charge. And this is the problem that all of Jean Mises' heroines to have is there. It, they they want the man to take charge and then they get hurt because the men wind up being Mr. Blanks, dominating people. But they've kind of, they've also invited those, those are the people they've invited in. Uh, that the, the, you know, the, sometimes you hear guys complaining that uh, I was really nice and now she's going out with this jerk. And okay, so, so be it. And it's like nice guys finish last. And that can partly be, you know, cultural, modifications of women through movies are are told what love is and it's love is some guy you know being passionate and then aloof or whatever and if a guy's nice you kind of like what's wrong with him um and men have their own problem uh with being told what loving a woman is and what it means and how it should happen and then they try and it's a, it's the wrong metric uh you you know if love doesn't see you so you have Wallace Stevens has a great line he says a man and a woman are one a man and a woman and a blackbird are one it's like, what well who the hell's the blackbird the blackbird is the third term that it is only resulting from the love of the man and the woman the blackbird can be a, a bird of love it can be a bird of hate it can be a bird of love that turns to hate the blackbird is, is what the love you have for each other allows to fly over your head. There is no blackbird, there's no man and a woman. And if, if a man and a woman are one, then the blackbird is there with him and them. And you know, you ever had that situation where you're arguing with your partner and you, you're both starting to realize that this is stupid. You know, you're arguing about the garbage and you're, and you're still arguing. That's a great moment, I'll give you a relationship tip that's a great moment for one of the other of you to say what what's what's happening with to our to our blackbird here uh is it our blackbird is hurt and so now so we're hurting each other that happened with renee and 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 sass the blackbird got hurt and then they each had their own interpretation of who had hurt their blackbird and uh because if you say that how is our blackbird been hurt you can back up the argument to that, that they maybe they said something that hurt your feelings a little bit five minutes ago and you're kind of trying to press it and then they tell you to take out the garbage and you're like i'm busy and they're like you're always busy and then you're at it and your blackbirds get is because your blackbirds hurt so when you don't know why you're arguing um see to your blackbird take care of your blackbird i mean he calls it a blackbird i think instead of like a, you know a pretty bird because it's love is complicated and it's, it can be beautiful. A blackbird can be beautiful. A blackbird can be a harbinger of death. And relationships live and relationships die. But they all have a bird. Love is a bird that floats above whatever your love reason. And the bird doesn't live in the, in the partner A. And the bird doesn't live in partner B. You cannot generate a blackbird by yourself. You can only generate it with someone else. And it's not their blackbird. And it's not your blackbird. It's the blackbird. And if you don't both take care of it, Flies away. Okay, I'm gonna end on that little um, relationship tip. So I will be here for open classroom um, Wednesday at 11. And thank you very much for uh, for listening. I'll eventually get this on YouTube, uh, and it takes a little. If you're watching it, or it, it usually takes about a half hour, uh, so it should be up on BB Collaborate by um, by 9:30. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out how to turn this off. Um, recording in progress. I know that. Stop recording. Okay. I'm going to stop recording. Bye.